Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, the Black Keys kicking us off with a little bit of fever and uh, hope that all of you are avoiding that at this point. Uh, welcome to our webinar, AIA Contracts During COVID-19, Collaboration and Communication. Thank you to all of us for joining, or thank you to all of you for joining us, and please continue to send your recommendations to us for future programs. Uh, you can reach us at communications at architects.org. I'm Eric White, Executive Director of the BSA, and we all know that we are entering a new world in response to the virus. I'm sure that you know this uh, very well and that uh, we do not wanna necessarily spend a lot of time going through all that you're, you're hearing about, but we want to focus today on uh, what's, what are resources that we can send to share and help you. We're doing that through several different ways, just to update you. Uh, at resources at architects.org, uh, we are trying to focus on materials that will help you directly that you might not otherwise know about. We're also sharing these webinars, uh, and we're aiming uh, to do two a week. Presently, uh, the knowledge communities are in I on hiatus, but actually our first one tonight will be kicking off uh, with a webinar on SketchUp. We are also helping identify potential facility locations to, for the state to set up responses to COVID-19 that can include emergency healthcare as well as isolation areas. And we're working with the BSA Make Tank knowledge community that is using 3D printers to encourage the production of masks to help healthcare workers during this crisis. There's much more that we're working on, but you're really here for the session AIA contracts during COVID-19. So I'm very excited to introduce our speakers, Jay Wickersham, FAIA, a partner at Noble Wickersham and Hart, uh, Design and Construction and Environmental Law, and Jane Weinsapple, FAIA, founding principal of Lear's Weinsapple. Now, before we begin, just a few rules. Because we have a large number of participants, you'll all be kept on mute. During the Q&A, you've sent a number of pre uh, to us pre-questions and we'll be trying to answer those as best we can. Um, if you would like, you can also use the chat uh, uh, model and uh, we will try to, to uh, post those as, as much as we can. We are also recording this session that will be posted on architects.org just as last uh, week's sessions were, were posted. When you go to our webpage, scroll down to find COVID-19 resources, including the webinar. This should be up by tomorrow or Thursday. And just as a reminder, our next webinar is next Friday on construction administration, this coming Friday, on construction administration during COVID-19 with Sheila Kennedy, FAIA, and Tina Stanislavski, AIA. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Jay and Jane. Thank you. Well, thank you, Eric. Uh, this is Jay Wickersham. Um, I'm here with uh, Jane Weinzappel. And also I wanna thank um, all of the great BSA staff, Billy Craig, um, Caitlin Hart, and Patricia Olsham for putting this uh, together on such short notice. So we're gonna start with, our, our presentation itself will be about um, 20 minute, 25 minutes or so, and then we will look to, um, you know, answer some questions and then have a wrap up for to, to move, move, move ahead with again in, information about other resources and other upcoming um, BSA events. So, here are the things that the four issues that Jane and I are going to talk about. First of all, a quick recap on the shutdown order that Governor Baker issued yesterday, its effect on workplaces, and its interaction with the construction shutdown orders that were already issued in Boston and Cambridge last week. Um, and then we're gonna talk about three different scenarios that you may be facing in projects. What if a project is under construction and that has stopped or slowed? What if you are in design and the design process has stopped or slowed? And what to do if the project is continuing, but you're concerned that because of the issues of working remotely, you may not be able to meet a deadline. And so we're going to address these four um, in turn. So starting with the first one, as everyone is aware, 
Um, Governor Baker issued um, an order yesterday, which took effect uh, just five minutes ago, noon today, and it will be in effect through noon of April 7th at least. Uh, none of us, of course, know how much longer these, these orders may be in effect. All non-essential businesses must close their physical workplaces, and we are encouraged to continue operations remotely. Um, I think, you know, in speaking with Eric, you know, we are assuming that virtually all BSA member firms have already moved to uh, this set of remote operations. There is an exclusion for construction projects. Um, construction under the governor's order is considered um, an essential business. And so that in turn um, will have a potential effect upon architects who are performing CA services for these projects. As again, and there are no, this is all from an initial reading, there, there's no definitive interpretation, but I believe that it's a pretty clear reading of the governor's order that there are two ways in which architects who are providing CA services are in fact providing essential services. One is because those who are supporting the construction operation inspection and maintenance of construction sites, that is an exempted role. The other is professional services when necessary to assist in compliance with legally mandated activities and critical service, critical sector services. So construction is a critical sector. We all know that there are legal requirements for CA for issuing um, certificates at the end of construction. So all of that goes to say that work for an architect on a construction site would be an essential um, service. That doesn't necessarily mean that that is how those CA services um, will necessarily be provided. And I'm just going to touch upon that today and refer all of you to um, a webinar that is going to be specifically focused on construction administration, as Eric said, on Friday at 10 a.m. This is a very fast evolving field. A lot is going on already in terms of webcams, in terms of ways in which um, architects can do site visits without physically being present. And, and all of that, I strongly encourage you to keep up with the BSA on what are kind of best practices. In any case, we would continue to take a very conservative view that the architect's office itself, don't assume it is exempted, even if you were sitting in an office doing um, shop drawing reviews and so forth. Um, everyone agrees that, that for health reasons alone, that is not um, sound practice and so you know we continue to strongly um, you know encourage that all work within architects offices themselves should be done remotely. That's the governor's order. Um, so let me now just briefly touch upon the shutdown orders that were issued in Boston and Cambridge last week on construction. Those remain in effect. They have not been superseded by the governor's order. So as of today, only health-related facilities may proceed or certain limited work that would make a building safe or habitable or in Cambridge only ongoing construction on one to three family housing projects. That may change. Um, you know, Eric's informed me that there are ongoing discussions now in Boston, whether there's a possibility that the current construction shutdown order might be modified in some way, but that has not happened. So again, as of today, the ground rules under which we're all living is the governor's statewide order, um, and in addition, the specific construction orders in Boston and Cambridge. Um, so, so Jane, kind of just at this point, just to kind of give you a chance to 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 um, touch base here. What have you seen in your office in terms of projects in construction that may have been stopped either in Boston and Cambridge or or in other locations? 
Yes, uh, we have three projects in Boston uh, that um, are affected um, by the, the construction shutdown. Um, and they are in different, uh, different phases, early, uh, middle and late phases. Um, and the, uh, we are continuing to provide uh, construction administration services uh, remotely, uh, rather seamlessly, given that um, many of the um, uh, project meetings uh, and other kinds of communication were already uh, accessible remotely. So that's, that's been fairly seamless. We had also uh, already um, put in place um, uh, uh, oh, maybe a week and a half ago um, the uh, on-site protocols uh, bef before this shutdown of, of what staff, uh, um, what measures staff should take when they were on site, including uh, making sure that uh, you absolutely needed to be at the site, that it could not be handled remotely. Um, and and that's, uh, that's continuing. And, uh, uh, and I'm sure the, uh, these discussions will continue next, next Friday on how to do a, a punch list with the CM providing photographs, whether that's sufficient for some uh, elements, but may not be for others. Uh, so this will continue to be worked on how to best uh, do this given the shutdown order. Right. Well, thank, thanks, Jane. And, you know, again, you know, as, as I think, you know, what we both want to emphasize is this is all very fluid. You know, th there are no clear cut answers because we've never faced a situation quite like this before. And wh whatever we think today may be kind of the best practices, you know, or the, or, or that the rules we're working under may have changed quite radically in just a few days. But this, that at least is kind of like the best we can say for right now. So now let me move on to the first of our three scenarios. And this is exactly what, what Jane just talked about. You know, what if your project is in construction and it has either stopped or slowed? So in, in legal terms, you know, this is um, a suspension. Um, it may have come from the owner. You may have gotten um, actually an email or a letter from the owner saying the project has been stopped or suspended. Um, I've also heard clients saying they've gotten letters from the contractor for projects in Boston saying we are shutting down because of this order from the city of Boston. So whatever was the, the reason why the project has stopped, you know, I think the first thing to do that, that Jane and I would agree upon is just keep the communications going and be clear. Um, you know, it's, this is a complicated, potentially messy situation. So, you know, write back as soon as you hear in writing or even verbally that it looked that a project is being stopped, you know, write back. It can be an email. It doesn't have to be a formal letter. This is our understanding of where we are. And, um, you know, th this is our understanding of the current status. And then the next steps, and this is, you know, as, as Jane talked about, just because construction has stopped does not necessarily mean that the architect is going to instantly stop work. Um, uh, on this second bullet, there are ongoing CA services that may make a lot of sense to keep working on, you know, submittal reviews, responding to RFIs, change orders. Um, there will be a final requisition from the contractor to be reviewed and certified. So all of that work you want to um, keep going on to complete it in an orderly way. And to the first bullet, um, I have at least one client where what they've gotten is a partial um, suspension, where all of the interior work for a large project has stopped but they are continuing with the exterior so that the building will be buttoned up and kept weather tight. Here again, there's an important role for the architect to document that. Um, there may need to be a new set of drawings showing the new limited scope of work. So again, everyone is clear upon 
what is um, what what is going to happen next. Um, and so, you know, again, one of the things that that we have um, as an advantage is most contracts actually address this question. You know, the notion of a suspension of a stoppage in work with the hope or the expectation that the project will restart, it will be able to keep going at some point in the future. That's a suspension. It's not a termination. It's not force majeure. Um, and AIA contracts say that once the work restarts, there will be an equitable adjustment to the schedule, the compensation, other contract terms. Um, your contract also may even entitle you to demobilization costs. If you have a significant team and you're going to have to wind that down, um, that you may be entitled to those costs. And if so, you should include those in your final invoice. Um, but again, you know, the most important point um, is keep in good contact with your clients and to let them know your goal here is to keep working in the best interest of the project, whatever the project needs, whether it's a partial slowdown or, or a suspension. Um, where are we? What needs to be done? And how can we make sure everything is in the best possible shape to be restarted um, in the future? Um, J Jane, do you want to sort of, sort of further um, kind of thoughts or comments you may want to have on any, any of these points on the, these projects under construction? Uh, the, on that last one, the, the um, in, uh, communication, I think, uh, asking that same question of what can be most helpful under these circumstances of the contractor or CM is, um, is also useful. Um, ideally, in, um, uh, you know, in the, the presence of the owner. But uh, whether it's uh, independently or not, they, to uh, be able to focus on the most useful um, uh, work at the moment. Great. Okay. So that's okay. So that's one scenario. When I think you know the most dramatic scenario, um, one which projects in Boston have already faced, and I think there we have to assume there will be expectations of it happening elsewhere. I'll also mention, and this maybe we'll come back to this in the Q and A. Even if a project has not formally been suspended, we have to assume that contractors are going to have trouble getting materials, getting um, you know, elements that they need. There are going to be slowdowns whether owners want it or not. And so again, one of the architect's roles here can be keep the communication flowing, you know, be very clear in documenting information, decisions that are made, what are the next steps. So, so that's on construction. Um, let, let me now move to what if it's a project that is in design? And again, from the owner's side, um, there was a decision to either stop or to slow the design process. The same issues of good, clear communication, you know, state would, would apply here as well. Um, you know, if the owner asked you to stop, it will almost certainly be a suspension. We may see some projects abandoned and that would be terminated. Uh, but I think, you know, we can expect that if projects are slowed down, that will be a suspension. It may be a complete suspension, go on hold, or it may be, let's slow down, you know, maybe continue on with master planning work, but we're not quite ready for you to go into construction documents on phase one as we previously had. Um, and so again, just as with construction, you know, document the communications, document the status, you know, so that everyone is clear. Um, and again, to confer with everyone, um, all the members of the team, the owner, the CM, if, if one has been appointed, your own consultants, what are the next steps? Is the project going to continue in some form? And if so, then what are the changes? What are the elements that would continue versus those that would not? What might be the impact upon project schedule? If the project is going to con completely shut down, there are still going to be actions that should be taken so that it can be wrapped up in an orderly, rational way. 
There may be deliverables you are going to be asked to complete, um, files to organize. You know, ag again, you know, think of all of this as putting a project um, in the best possible status so that it can be picked up again in the future. Um, and so again, you know, those, the same issues here would apply as with construction. Um, those same legal contract terms would come into play. This will most likely be a suspension. If it is a suspension, you may, and you're really being asked to um, have your team step down, you may be entitled to de demobilization costs depending upon your contract. And you certainly will be entitled to an adjustment in the contract terms once the project starts up again. Um, but again, with all of this, it's, it's communication. It's um, make, keeping in clear touch with your client um, in a period that you know, is of enormous stress to them as well as to you so that you know, everyone can be as clear as possible and we're, we're trying not to have any misunderstandings. Um, so, so, so Jane, from, from your, your perspective on this, I'm thinking both your experience here as well as in past kind of recessions, you know, what, 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 what kinds of um, you know, advice would you have? What kinds of uh, you know, practices were, were, were helpful in the past for you and your firm? Well, I'd, I'd say a, a, a couple of things. One, to, in staying with, uh, in communication, uh, I think having an attitude of how can, uh, how can we help you in either um, making this decision or in um, uh, what next steps would be that would, would help you in the long run is, is, I think, very useful to clients because they, they uh, as you said, are um, a, a kind of caught with not knowing quite what to do. So helping them make a few of, uh, or many, of next steps that will uh, 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 both uh, help in uh, restarting the project if, that, if it's uh, going that direction or continuing it in a modified way. They may not have all the decision makers available. Uh, but they may uh, be able to do some good groundwork in, say, programming or, or something so that they're, they're ready when the decision makers are, because this could all then pivot and be um, uh, you know, a demand for things happening very quickly. Um, the other thing is to, uh, to ask the, um, I remember in 2008, uh, when projects were uh, uh, slowing down or stopping, we had a, uh, a client who had state bond money who actually wanted to accelerate the work and uh, to be able to get in uh, on a good uh, bidding uh, situation. And um, uh, we had to strategize with them how that could actually happen and then, um, you know, kind of accomplish it. Um, um, as as well, um, so I think they to be as helpful as possible in enabling the best decision, and um, being open to um, unexpected um, needs on the client side. Yeah, no, that that point you just made about the the, the acceleration is a very interesting one. Um, you know, and one could certainly imagine um, healthcare clients who are going to want to try to get their projects, if there are ongoing projects, particularly ones that are going to be making beds available, to try to get those moving ahead as quickly as, as possible. So, so we may have, you know, interesting situations of projects that are speeding up as well as ones that are slowing down or stopping. Um, so, so now let me kind of turn to the third scenario. And th this is actually the one where I think a number of, um, you know, we've been fielding a number of questions in our um, law practice. I have actually seen a couple of versions of letters that insurance companies have drafted on behalf of design firms. Um, in at least one case, a suggestion that a design firms should just know to put every one of their clients on notice about potential delays. That advice, I think, is not sound advice. Um, 
architects and designers are not in the same legal situation as contractors. You know, contractors, as we all know, are in a very tough situation legally when it comes to delays. They must give the owner notice. They are not entitled to extra time unless there's a change order typically. And they may not be entitled to extra delay costs at all if there's a no damages for delay clause. Architects contracts are much more forgiving. You know, a standard AIA contract says that you will meet your schedule except for reasonable cause. Um, or many contracts will say, except for causes outside of the architect's control. Um, you know, and if there ever was a situation for, uh, that was reasonable cause or cause outside of control, uh, this is the one. Um, so, you know, I, I don't view, you know, it as necessarily needed or even wise to do a blanket notification to all of our clients that we may be delayed. They all know what's going on. And as Jane said, you want to really send the message that we're here to help them and serve them. But you do need to be realistic if you see that you're not going to be able to make a specific deadline. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why that may happen. You know, it, it's inevitable that there will be inefficiencies from our now trying to work remotely. Um, our consultants may not be able to keep up. You know, we may have challenges about coordinating um, materials and have a fully coordinated set of um, submittables that meet our standards for quality. So whatever the reason may be, again, the point is just be clear, be prompt, be transparent. You know, if you see that there is a potential for a delay, tell the client and tell them how you are going to try to solve the problem. Um, you know, again, I, I think there are, there are plenty of legal protections. The important thing is to maintain the relationship, maintain that kind of trust on your client's side that you're going to do everything you can to kind of keep working with them. Um, and so again, on, on the, these, these points here, most architectural contracts will excuse a delay. Um, but they often will require you actually to notify the client promptly. And even if there isn't a notice clause, even if your contract is silent, it's always good policy. So on, on these issues, um, we want to, you know, ask you to be, you know, advise you to be realistic, be transparent, um, and maintain that good relationship of trust. Um, and, and Jay, maybe again, if you want to perhaps um, you know, add some, some further thoughts you may have on this. Well, the uh, idea of delay and the idea of um, uh, capacity, uh, I, I think it, this is a fluid moment. And if, if, uh, if you know of co colleagues who have um, staff who are uh, not able to uh, uh, work to their full capacity and and, uh, and it's a issue both for the staff and for you, there is, there is also the possibility of um, taking on staff temporarily from a colleague who um, um, is uh, uh, under, has, has either had delays or that, uh, uh, so I would, I would say staying open to ways to work um, in this unsettling environment that um, uh, that is flexible. Uh, this might be short term. Um, that, that certainly has happened in the recession in, in um, uh, 2008, where the staff were uh, temporarily loaned. Um, so um, that's another way to deal with uh, meeting a deadline. Um, yeah, no, that, that's, that's a great suggestion there, Jane. And, and I will mention also one of the things in planning this program that we talked about are some of the other issues that, that are beyond the scope here, but that you know, the BSA um, is looking to perhaps put future programs together. And one may be um, something about some of these HR employment issues about um, sharing of staff. 
as well as um, some of the very important steps that, that the state has, has done to make unemployment insurance more available, even for people who are actually kind of on furlough, who are continuing to work in some capacity. Um, again, it's outside of our scope or our expertise, but keep an eye out for, for forthcoming BSA programs that may be able to provide you with some more specifics and, and details on, on this topic. Um, so listen, so that's really kind of, that, that's sort of the main body that we wanted to get through. So we're now going to kind of move into a Q&A stage. And um, what we've done is we, a bunch of questions that were solicited early on, we have um, kind of taken. And so Jane and I are gonna start to pose some of those questions um, to, to each other of, about, um, you know, to, to kind of expand upon some of these points. So, so Jane, do you want to hit, hit me with one to begin with? Uh, sure. This was uh, a couple of people who uh, um, asked in different ways uh, Steve's question, do all AIA agreements have force majeure clauses? Maybe tell us about force majeure too. Sure. Um, it, it's actually, it's an interesting point. And in fact, many lawyers like me have had to kind of update our knowledge going back to law school. Um, Interestingly, we throw the term force majeure around. It is actually very rare to have a force majeure clause in an architectural contract. Force majeure is, is a French term. Um, it effectively, it's often translated into English as acts of God, in a, at least in a, in a past, past environment. So it's Things like this, it's, it's wars, earthquakes, insurrections, and quite often um, pandemics may be included in the definition. Um, you will sometimes see force majeure clauses in a construction contract, um, very rarely in an architectural contract, at least in this country. Um, and that's because force majeure is not actually a legal term that has any deep meaning in American law. It, it actually is, as you might not be surprised to know, a, a concept from French law. It is from continental Europe, not the Anglo-American tradition. But it is, there, there is a, a, a comparable set of ideas that if a contract is impossible to carry out, um, that, that's our equivalent. You know, the world has turned upside down and there's no way for the contractor to, you know, possibly build this building because the materials are not there. The staff is all, isn't allowed to report to the work site, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then under one of these doctrines, you could have a contract nullified. That's really what force majeure does is that, that the contract is either stopped or is just completely nullified. As I've kind of suggested earlier, that's really not a very useful concept, I believe, for where we are right now. I think we should be thinking in terms of the standard industry and AIA forms and thinking in terms of suspension. These are all pro these are projects, if they stop, they are being suspended. Some of them may be terminated, but for the most part, they're going to be suspended, I expect, with the hope that they can restart. And if they are suspended, contracts actually have quite specific language, and we've got a lot of legal concepts there. And I mentioned them, including the possibility of demobilization and remobilization costs, and certainly the um, right to have the terms the schedule and potentially the compensation renegotiated um, when and if the work restarts. So again, you know, for force majeure, a lot of people are asking about it. Um, I really urge people to kind of focus on the notion of suspension. We're putting the project um, on hold and with the hope that it will restart. Um, so, so Jane, I'm going to, um, talk of actually sort of raise, although I know we, I know that we said this was going to be picked up um, later this week, maybe a few thoughts that you have, because we have a number of questions, one from Isaac, one 
from um, Kathleen, I think from others, specifically about um, the CA process. And, you know, how do we deal with these issues that traditionally you had to be on site, you know, punchless site visits, um, you know, what, 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 what can you share about at least the discussions that are ongoing and some of the systems that people are trying to put, put, in, put in place to, to address that and, and keep, keep, our, keep everybody healthy and safe? Yes, and there, there, there are two sides. Uh, the, the one is to protect the health of staff. And, and we, um, um, several weeks ago, um, articulated some protocols for, for uh, staff. Uh, the first uh, was, well, they were uh, numerous, uh, to use only your own PPE, uh, to uh, wear gloves because uh, on site, to keep the social distancing, to, uh, they were uh, um, uh, numerous. But the first one was to see if it is actually required to go to the site. Uh, is there a way that the contractor can send you photographs first uh, and to uh, make sh uh, to keep as few people on the site as possible so only one person go uh, not two or three share with um, um, either video or uh, uh, Skype um, what is going on at the site so that you can you can share the the uh, difficulties and the responses that might be being made so uh, the, in keeping safe that that was one um, um, so is the site visit uh, necessary uh, with with punch lists we're looking at um, the again the CM providing uh, photographic content for a uh, you know 450 uh, punch list items and to um, uh, identify those that can be covered uh, uh, virtually that way. There will be some that uh, uh, at, uh, where the photograph is not sufficient, uh, but to try to use that as much as possible to um, to um, do the um, uh, field reports um, uh, uh, virtually there can be a, a you know the project meeting and uh, site issues raised there uh, uh, currently um, many sites you know as we've already discussed have um, uh, much uh, much less to nothing happening on them uh, so the um, the field reports that's a, a an interesting um, interesting one that I'll have to look into more. Yeah, no, and I think that's, I mean, that this is, again, I, I think, you know, th this is all, I, I think just these are important conversations we're all going to be having. This is going to be fast evolving. Um, you know, again, again, I think some of the questions that we got, you know, contracts are written with the assumption of physical field, field site visits. But first of all, that is subject to any of these, you know, not only to local orders of government that you, you shouldn't, perhaps you shouldn't be traveling, but also to health advisories. You know, I think as an employer, you are absolutely entitled to protect your staff. And if um, you don't believe that that's, you know, best practices to be on the site, and if there are, you know, kind of these kinds of reasonable, feasible alternatives, um, then you know I, I have every expectation that you know this will effectively become the professional standard going forward. I, I expect that we'll probably actually we may very well have more kind of virtual site visits of various kinds even after the crisis um, is 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 over. But you know those concerns that the Jane talked about, you you are entitled to um, take them into account, and that's. Balanced. And so again, it's just open communications. If you can't get to the site or you're recommending these alternatives, just be clear to the client and the CM, here's how we're going to be doing this going forward. And um, you know, I'm I, I expect that people are going to be are going to want to work with each other to, to make this all work. Um, 
So we've got just a couple more minutes. I don't know, if, Jane, if you want to have maybe, if, if there's one there's more a, question that you sure. see. To, to there's another to one um, How uh, from Ellen. How can differing tolerances of risk, <laughs> um, specifically the COVID exposure among owners, designers, and contractors be reconciled? And what impact do local or state orders have on the various uh, parties? Yeah, so that's well, that's 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 a great question, and so I think that that actually kind of poses what what I was what Jane and I were just talking about a, a little more a little more starkly. Um, government orders come first, so so if local or state or ultimately if the federal government were kind of issuing certain edicts about what you can or can't do, that that supersedes whatever is is in is in a contract. Um, you also, as an employer, have you know responsibilities for your employees, and so if if you think that an owner is being unreasonable in let's say demanding an on-site visit and it's not meeting you know what you would view as best practices for um, safety, you know you know I would say then you know you are entitled to be protecting your employees. I'm hoping that you know again I, I think we hope with all of this. Open, open conversation, um, you know, figuring out how to make things work rather than turning it into confrontation is going to be, you know, what's going to be the, the, best, the best approach. Um, but but there, will, there, will be, there will be challenges and, um, you know, I think it's up to all of us to protect everybody we work, who, who works for us and, and, and with us um, with the best practices. So I think we're now really getting, we're pretty much now up to the, the close. It's now 1240. Um, so we're now going to uh, turn it back to Eric. And he wanted to say a few remarks um, wrapping up this event as well as uh, going forward um, for some of our next um, up upcoming events with the BSA. Well, Jay and Jane, thank you so much for uh, for this, and thank you all for joining us and share. Uh, please share your feedback to us at communications at architects.org. You can stay up to date with our latest news at architects.org and through Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, and of course, signing up for our e-newsletter currents. Uh, many of you have shared many questions, and we're going to try as much as possible to share those with. Uh, our speakers today and see if we can get you answers uh, to questions that you may not have uh, heard answers to today. We hope you will join us on Friday uh, for construction administration during COVID-19. I know that's a subject that many of you have questions on. And this will be followed by sessions next week with top topics, speakers, and times to be announced soon. We're aiming to have webinars on Tuesdays and Fridays. And before I go, I just want to make a public thank you to all my colleagues on staff. Like you, we were operating in a new world and figuring things out. And uh, thank you for your patience as we, as we do that. And finally, please join me in thanking our speakers, Jay Wickersham, FAIA, and Jane Winesapple, FAIA. We know that your lives have been turned upside down and truly appreciate your willingness to take the time and share your knowledge. Thank you for what you do and for doing it so well. And as a reminder to all of you, be safe, be healthy, and be kind, and heed the advice of the Bee Gees. Thank you everyone for joining us today and see you Friday. Thanks, Eric. Thanks a lot, Eric, and thanks, thanks everybody.